Slendy, ego, Slendy, ego, Slendy, ego, Slendy, hey, you already know what's up. What's that another home run? But you know the job ain't done. So we hold that trophy up. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 549 of the Talking Friars podcast and YouTube show. Ben Fadden with you here, January 5th, 2024. Hopefully, everybody is doing well here on this, what, Friday afternoon. Thank you all for taking the time to either watch the show live on YouTube, replay on YouTube, or you're listening to the podcast platforms. The main Padres topic I want to touch on today unrealistic Padres free agent targets because there are some big names that are still out there. There are some names that are floated out there amongst Padres fans, but there are those names that I don't think make sense for this Padres team. Some may think they make sense and feel free to let me know uh, in the comments, in the chat, if you disagree with some of the unrealistic free agents that I list here. Um, And then also, there's going to be a cool interview that I did with Ronica Stone, who is going to be one of the stars of San Diego Mojo, the women's volleyball team coming to town in their inaugural season in 2024. So that'll be coming up here later in the show. But yeah, first off, let's start with five unrealistic free agents that I have right off the bat. Then I'll go to the chat. Then I'll go back to the free agent page um, and discuss some other ones as well. Obviously, questions, comments in the chat. I will get to those, and if you want to make sure I get to your comment and your question, you can use that Super Chat button. If you want to join the show, you can click that link that is pinned up at the top of the chat. First one here, and it is Cody Bellinger. Why is Cody Bellinger an unrealistic Padres free agent target? Well, he's coming off of a really good year. He's won an MVP before. Scott Boris is his agent. He's the best outfielder on the market. can play first, can play center. Good defensively, has really good moments with the bat. He's out of the Padres' price range. I mean, the Padres, they have about $25 million of room, is what it seems like, before they get to that 237 CBT threshold, that first one. And we know the Padres want to stay under that threshold. They don't want to go over, because then there's more taxes, and then there's you could be losing draft picks, and they, they just need to reset. You know, the Dodgers reset before they went all in on Otani and had the big off season. Like this is, you got to reset. And I don't even know if it's about resetting for the Padres. It's just how can we, you know, get a competitive payroll out there year in, year out. Don't have a TV deal. Didn't make the postseason. You had to go get a loan this past year. Like forget about, oh, we need to get under the CBT number. No, we need to just find the right spot. And Eric Grubner has already talked about this this offseason, pretty much have to find that right spot, that limit. What's our limit payroll-wise in this market with the fans showing up, trying to build a competitive team, but we can't go too high. So Cody Bellinger, why is he unrealistic? He's just not in in the Padres' price range. You know, the Padres, Harrison Bader, Kevin Kiermaier, they just signed with the Mets, the Blue Jays, Michael A. Taylor is out there. The Padres are interested in him, reportedly. They're not even signing Harrison Bader or Kevin Kiermaier. That's $10, $12 million around that for one year. Cody Bellinger is going to be asking for $200 plus million. So it's just the Padres, they already have long-term contracts given out. They couldn't give Soto $30 plus million just for this season, and they're not going to sign him long-term. Blake Snell, he also wants a long-term contract. Like, that's not happening. That's another unrealistic target. Josh Hader wants a big long-term contract. These long-term contracts, they've already got Darvish, Musgrove, Swarz is kind of a long-term contract for a reliever, five years, and he's got, what, four more years left? And then on the position player side, obviously there's Fernando, there's Bogarts, there's Manny, there's Cronenworth. At some point here, the young players have to come up, and just payroll-wise, it just doesn't make sense for the Padres to do this. And then also... Forget the money, but just Bellinger as a player. Is he talented? Yeah. But what Cody Bellinger are the Padres going to get? Are they going to get last year's Cody Bellinger? Are they going to get 2018, 2019 Cody Bellinger? Or are they going to get the last three years before he went to the Cubs, Cody Bellinger? The last three years with the Dodgers. 
where the Dodgers, I think, non-tendered him because they didn't want to give him 17 mil or whatever it was for the 2023 season. And then the Cubs got him, and he ends up performing well. Like teams like that, the Giants, who made a trade today, the Cubs, teams like that makes more sense for them because they need to go spend. They have they they don't have the big long term contracts as many as the Padres do. So yeah, Bellinger, unrealistic. I get why he's a fit. Like he can play first. Padres need first base, powered bat, DH. He can do that. He can play center field. Can play other outfield spots. It makes sense like that, but money is a big part of this game. And so that's like the big reason why it's it's just unrealistic for anyone to expect the Padres to be even in on Cody Bellinger. I don't even think they should be in on him. It shouldn't even be a discussion. Maybe you check in because that's your job. Like AJ has to check in on everyone, but he knows that they're not going to be in on Cody Bellinger. So they're, they're, not, they're not wasting any time on Cody Bellinger this offseason. Um, Blake Snell, as I mentioned, that's another unrealistic one. Tremendous year. Cy Young this past year, obviously, 2 2 5 ERA. He was working deep into games because of how dominating his stuff was. A lot of strikeouts, led the league in walks, though. There's question marks with Snell, like, what is he going to be in this next contract? And again, like, if he wants $200 million, he just shot Yamamoto's never pitched in the big leagues before. And he just got over 300 from the Dodgers. Snell's like, hey, wait, I've won two Cy Youngs. This guy's never pitched in the big leagues before. I'm in my prime, just won a Cy Young. I won a Cy Young in both leagues. Had a great performance in the World Series, and my manager's the one that took me out. That wasn't on me. And you're not going to give me 200? Like, like they're going to be asking for 200. I don't know if he's going to get that, but the Padres are not going to do that. And even if the Padres had the money, I don't know if they would do that because they know that they have young pitching coming up. Robbie Snelling, Dylan Lesko's a couple years away, but Drew Thorpe they just acquired. They have Michael King, Brito, Vasquez, see what they can give you. Iriarte, Mazer, they're still in the, the farm system. As of now, we'll see if a trade ends up happening. Like there's talent here. Snelling, did I mention him? I probably just did. Like there's talent in this farm system coming up. And Snell, there's some question marks there. He's not going to perform better than he did in his two Cy Young seasons. You're probably not going to get that Blake Snell. I, I would be surprised. If you get 2023 Blake Snell in terms of the numbers, ERA, winning the Cy Young, if this team that he signs with gets that Blake Snell at all in this next contract for a full season, I would be surprised if they get that Blake Snell. And again, financially for the Padres, $200 million for Blake. It's just unrealistic. They've already made their bed with the rotation. Musgrove loved the signing. It was a team-friendly contract, not a player-friendly contract. Darvish, that was more player-friendly, right? Paying him till he's like 42. And it's over $100 million. I get why they were doing that. Spread the AAV out. Lower it, I, I should say. Spread the contract, the money out to lower the AAV. I get it. But, you know, if you wanted Snell, you probably wouldn't have given the money to Darvish. You would have given the money to Musgrove, but probably not to you, Darvish. You probably would have just had him play the contract out. So, yeah. And, like, the moves that the Padres have made this offseason with Matsui and Go and trading Barlow to get Enel De Los Santos, who is making less money as a reliever, can fill that spot that Barlow had. Moves like that, those are not big, huge contracts, right? The Padres were not in on Shohei Otani. They didn't have a meeting with Shohei Otani. Neither with uh, Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Like, that's just not where this Padres team is at this offseason. So don't expect those big contracts. Blake Snell, Cody Bellinger, Josh Hader is another one. He's going to want over $100 million. He's probably going to want better than the Edwin Diaz contract, which obviously is a huge risk. Any team that gives Hader that is that's a huge risk for a reliever, giving over $100 plus million. And what if he still only wants to pitch the ninth inning? Now, if you get your money, Josh, over $100 million, and you still say, yeah, only ninth inning, that's a terrible look on you. And it was a terrible look on you to say, oh, are we in the playoff race? And trying to blame the Padres for why you weren't being used for four outs more often. Like, you think the Padres wanted to do that? Of course they did. So I'm not the biggest fan of Josh Hader. Um, I was on foul territory. I don't know if anyone saw that. People did see it. There's been some great comments, and I appreciate all the kindness from everyone 
that has made those comments. But if you missed it, yesterday I went on foul territory with Eric Kratz and AJ Przinsky, San Diego legend Adam Jones, uh, Scott Braun. That was amazing. Great experience. I can't thank them enough for having me on to talk about the Padres offseason. Um, and yeah, I was, I, I, Eric Kratz like could tell that I wasn't very happy with Josh Hader during that, our, our conversation. Yeah, I'm just not the biggest fan, especially after that comment. Great when he's on the mound, but I just wish that he would, you know, pitch more and be more flexible. But he was a free agent coming up, but that's not something that the Padres are going to do. Giving over $100 million to a reliever. I mean, I guess props to whatever team does have have the balls, I guess, to do that, right? I mean, the Rangers might do that. They just won a World Series, though, so they can take the risk. If it doesn't work out, we just won the World Series in 2023, you know? Um, I don't know how in the Dodgers are going to be, the Giants maybe, but that's a big risk. You know, Suarez, I think some people thought Suarez was a lot of money for less than half of what Hader might get, or definitely less than half of what Hader is going to want. So financially, and because it's a reliever, and it's not like he's pitching every day, like that's definitely an unrealistic, that's more unrealistic than Blake Snow, in my opinion. Another one that is here that I have on my list, Clayton Kershaw, because, I mean, don't know if anyone knows, but he pitches for the Dodgers, and he'd never come to the Padres, just like he'd never go to the Giants, I don't think. Some would say, well, no, players don't care about that. That's more of a fan thing, like not going to the rival. But when you've been a Dodger your whole career, it's like Derek Jeter. He, would, he was not going to go sign with the Red Sox for one more year you know, to, to, to finish out his career because that's the only team that would give him a contract. That wasn't going to happen. Kershaw's set for life. I don't think he's going to the Rangers. It's the Dodgers or retire. And I think he'll come back to the Dodgers and he'll pitch second half of the season. But yeah, Kershaw I saw on the free agent list. I'm like, yeah, that's definitely unrealistic. I know the Padres need starting pitching. It wouldn't be a long-term deal. There is the injury risk there as well. And the Padres need pitching that is healthy from the get-go, right? The urgency needs to be there. And Kershaw... He ended up going, I believe, uh, undergoing shoulder surgery uh, this past offseason. Or not this past offseason, this offseason. So it's just not a fit. Like health-wise, money-wise, the fact that he's a Dodger his whole career. I don't even think he's really a fit for any team other than the Dodgers. So that's definitely unrealistic. And Jordan Montgomery, he is the second biggest starting pitcher left behind Blake Snell. He could get something similar, I think, to the Patrick Corbin six years, 140. That contract has not worked out for the Nats beyond the first year when Corbin helped them go win the World Series. So it is worth it if you ask a Nationals fan. They might not like it now, but it, it is worth it. Just like the Bogarts contract, let's say. If the Padres win the World Series once, once, some may disagree, but if the Padres win the World Series once in this contract, in my opinion, I think that it is worth it. Same thing with the Manny, the Cronoworth, Darvish, Musgrove, all of them. It's worth it. If you win one World Series, it is worth it. Now, if you win one, we're going to want you to win more. But this franchise has never seen a World Series title ever, obviously. So we got to have our expectations low on the number of World Series. Like, World Series, those two words there, I don't even think that's in our vocabulary or shouldn't even be in our thought process right now. Like, let's get a complete roster first fill some holes, make the postseason first after coming off of a year that they didn't make the postseason. You know, let's get to the World Series. Let's let's win the NLCS. Let's let's get back to the NLCS. Let's get to the NLDS. You know, we got to take steps here. Uh, but I'm just saying, like, just going back to the Corbin thing, like, it was worth it. So if Jordan Montgomery, you know, he goes and wins a World Series with it, whoever signs him, it'll be worth it. Um, but yeah, the Padres... They're again, they're not in that market to give a long term deal to any pitcher. They're not even in the market to sign Lucas Giolito to a two year deal or a one year with an option like that pillow contract. They're not in the market for uh, oh, def. I mean, I wouldn't have done it either, but the Reds, right? They go sign Frankie Montas to like 16 million dollars or whatever. They're not in the market for that. They're not in the market for Michael Walker with the Royals, Seth Lugo with the Royals for 15 mil a year or Waka for 16 mil a year. The exact deal that the Padres could have locked him down under because they had the club options, the simultaneous club options, they're not in that market. For starting pitching and free agency, what is the market going to be? 
for the pod or what market is are the Padres in? Is it one year less than 10 mil? I mean, then they're going to have to wait. Like Preller has said publicly to the media, probably waiting till January. And it might be late January because the market is still pretty slow right now. There were trades, a couple of trades that have gone down. There's been some free agent signings, but there's still a lot of pitching out there and a lot of teams that still need pitching that have more money to spend and are in a better position flexibility wise financially than the Padres are in. So we may have to be waiting here or a trade's going to happen to fill out some of these spots. But those are five that I have right off the bat. Montgomery, Kershaw, Hayter, Snell, Bellinger. And before I go to some others that may be unrealistic, I do want to go to the chat after this break. Check out Gaglion Bros Famous Cheesesteaks and Garlic Fries on Friars Road. You can visit their website, gaglionbros.com, for their entire menu and enjoy their cheesesteaks and fries at Petco Park and Snapdragon Stadium as well. Reminder, if you want to join the show, you can click that link pinned up at the top of the chat. Christopher says, well, even if they are unrealistic, if they fit the job, may as well make an offer. Sure. Yeah, I mean, you can make an offer, but that player is going to immediately decline it or the agent is going to decline it for the player because they know that that's not what the player is worth and that other teams will actually be serious with their offer. Mark says Bellinger is way out of San Diego's price range or they would have offered him a contract already. Has anyone offered Bellinger a contract? That hasn't even been leaked. Like there's been interest, but no one has, there's no one that I've seen out there that has reported, yeah, the Giants have offered a contract to Bellinger. I don't even know if they're in, they're at that stage yet, to be honest. Christopher says, I think just bringing up guys from the minors is not going to work. You don't always need someone from Major League Baseball uh, or with MLB experience, I should say, but it would definitely be nice to have, especially with two missing people. Yeah, I think that right now bringing up guys from the minors isn't going to work. I don't think Jacob Marcy's ready. Graham Pauly might not be ready. Jackson Merrill doesn't have a ton of experience in left field. He might be ready bat-wise, but he might also be rush rushing it. Might might try to put him in AAA for a little bit first. Um, so the way that the Padres, I think, are going to go for 2024 is bring in guys with experience could be Eddie Rosario, David Peralta, Tommy Pham, Trade, Kepler, Santander, Seth Brown, Randy Rosarena. I'm just throwing out some names that are coming off the top of my head. Could be someone like that. Kevin Pillar, cheap, one-year deal in center field. Wait for Marcy to come up. Michael A. Taylor, they're interested in him. Obviously, I did a video earlier today about Michael A. Taylor, so you can check that out if you have not already. Um, I think that they're going to do that. MLB experience, wait for these guys to come up and these guys can be there with this experience to make sure that those guys are not being rushed to the big leagues because that is going to hurt those players being rushed to the big leagues. That could hurt their confidence. You don't want to send top prospects back and forth. You, If they're up, at least I, I want them up. Keep them up. They need to play. That's 2025 more where you'll see, I think, a lot of the young talent consistently play. For now, I think it's going to be a bridge to those young players, maybe second half of the year, but we'll see. What's up, Carter? Devin says Blake Snell reunion is looking bleak. Well, yeah, that's just, it's not going to happen. Adrian says this just in, we're screwed. <laughs> that's what it's felt like at times this offseason, right? You're seeing all these teams be rumored in players, and you're not seeing a lot of Padres being interested in certain players. Devin says Marcus Stroman. That's more realistic than some of the other guys I named. His market value, though, is around $16 million, a little over 15 mil. The Padres are not in that market. And Marcus Stroman, I don't think it's going to be a one-year deal. You know, they're, they're, they're not in that. Would they be in the market for Stroman at that rate over Waka? Would they be in that market for Stroman over Lugo? I mean, I don't know. Lugo, I thought he was pretty impressive with the Padres this past year. Team guy, if it doesn't work out in the rotation for some reason, after working out this past year, you can put him in the bullpen. There's a strong bullpen already. You can add to that if you need to. But the Padres, I think they have told us that they're not in that market. So if Stroman is the spot track value here, the market value of a little over 15 mil, 15.633, then I don't think 
if that's correct, I don't think the Padres are going to be signing Marcus Stroman. It would be an it would be another interesting personality for sure. Yep, yep. Billy is way too expensive. Mark says Snell is going to Seattle after the trade. Seattle and San Francisco did. That's my guess. Maybe, but Robbie Ray wasn't going to be ready anyway because I think he just had Tommy John. So he's not going to be ready for San Francisco. Hanniger went back to Seattle, by the way. So we're not going to have to deal with him with the Giants. Robbie Ray to the Giants. Dee Sclafani went to Seattle. I mean, it doesn't seem like the Mariners are going to give a big long-term contract out to anyone. If there is someone to do it, you'd think it'd be Blake Snell. Because he wants to be in Seattle, I would think. He's from the area. He's a big Washington Huskies fan. Um, they, that makes sense. But Seattle, it doesn't seem like they want to give guys these big long-term contracts. Should they do it to Blake? Yeah, I think Mariners fans would say, yeah, you should. A guy that actually wants to be here, there's players that don't want to be with the Mariners. Snow wants to be in Seattle. I, at least I think that's what I'm seeing. You give them that money, but I don't think that they will. It, 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 again, it makes sense, but I don't think that they will. So it sucks for Mariners fans. Chris says, just signed Cody for 1.25 mil a year. Yeah, I know you're joking. <laughs> Screw the taxes. Yeah, Luke Rayleigh got traded. That was to Seattle. And he's an outfielder, right? Randy Rosarena is still there with the Tampa Bay Rays. Ivory says, Trey Turner took less to go to Philadelphia. I can have hope. Yeah, but Snell, this is like his last big time to cash in. He's a free agent. He just came off of a Cy Young. There's other places where he could go where he could feel like he could be a contender. I mean, he admitted last year, this was the most talented team he'll ever be on. He's not going to be on a team this talented again, and what happens? They miss the postseason. So there's other places he can go and get money and still be in contention. That's for sure. I see John. He is in here. What's up, my man? How's it going? It's going good, man. How are you doing? Doing all right. Doing all right. I uh, I wanted to come on. I mean, well, it's a nice sunny day here in San Francisco, mainly because they just got rid of Discofani. So they are pretty happy up here in Giants land. But uh, you know what? I am wondering more and more about our San Diego Padres and where they're going to be at. Um, but I actually wanted to talk to you, I guess, a little bit about, um, well, I guess, what are your thoughts about, what are the pressure on GMs and owners, especially to have a deadline, essentially? Because this this stove right now is incredibly cold. And, you know, I mean, obviously it's the off season and everything like that, but, you know, if you want to get people engaged, especially, you know, a little hyped about fan fest coming up or spring training or whatever, I mean, what do you, what, what are your thoughts on that? I guess I was wondering. Yeah. I don't think there's got to be a fan fest. Um, but yeah, the, <laughs> the, the urgency thing, owners, GMs, the players association wouldn't want that because no. like that, like takes away leverage. I mean, the Padres, they, Use the leverage against um, what's his name? I'm forgetting already. Wu Suck Go, right? Because he had a deadline, and yeah. so he got like nothing. Or the the team he was on, the LG Twins, there they got nine hundred thousand from the Padres. Like they were disappointed in the amount of money that they got back. Um, yeah. So that would hurt the players. So the players would not agree to it. What the Frankie Montas deal? That's not hot enough for you on the hot stove, huh? <laughs> oh yeah all those minor league signings that we were we got yeah. oh my god so daniel thrilling camarena daniel camarena and whoever else who was uh who's that guy that hits like 147 that everyone's like oh he's super fast though oh oh the they, yeah didn't they johnson? yeah they just sent him for the giants yeah johnson yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's hot stove huh yeah. Oh man, the hottest of stove. Yeah. I mean, you know, it seems like it's 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 a tale as old as time in Padres land where, you know, there is zero zero talk from AJ Preller and, and the front office. And literally us Padre fans are like mice in a cage just wondering when's what's gonna happen. Literally. Hey, we're going but mad. but sometimes where it has been quiet and something just comes out of nowhere and we're like, oh wow, this is amazing. <laughs> That's what we're hoping for. We're hoping for another AJ Preller Hail Mary pass to quote a football term. I mean, you know, we're waiting for that. We're waiting for some trickery that we have seen for the last, you know, five, six years. And it's just to me, it's 
we're waiting. We're absolutely waiting. And it's just, what are we doing? What are we doing here? What, what, what are we waiting for? And, and my thing is, is that I've been taught, I've been hearing talks about like Im, 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 uh, Imiaga, or whatever, Imanaga. The Jap- Imanaga, excuse me. Yeah. That he's going to be the next big chip. And then other players are going to kind of, you know, kind of heat up or whatever. But, you know, in, in a way it's, it seems like it's kind of like a Mexican standoff right now between the agencies wanting to get the most maximum return for their players because they've seen the market. And then also, I think there's, I would imagine there are considerable amounts of teams that are just like, this is way too much. Like this is, this is unreasonable for us to sign these guys for maybe one or two year deals or something like that. Or we're not that desperate, I guess, for starting pitching or outfielders or first basemen or, and stuff like that. So I feel like it's a little bit of a Mexican standoff right now where well, that's happening, honestly, but nothing's yeah, happening. You can say like, and I think you're a lot of fans have been saying what you're saying. Like, what are we waiting for? Why is it so slow? Well, because of the market, like teams don't want to give Frankie Montas $16 million or 19 or whatever it was. They don't yeah. want to give Lucas Giolito. I don't know what the Red Sox are doing to trade Giolito, I guess, but uh, they don't want to give, Lucas Giolito, a one-year pillow contract. If he's good, he can go. If he sucks, okay, he can stay for a team that's not contending. Like, they don't want to do that. I guess the Royals are the only team that was like, yeah, Michael Walker, <laughs> Seth Lugo, come on down. We'll give you it. We'll, like, take, everyone, we'll take your option. Everyone, including A.J. Preller, they're just waiting for the market to come down because maybe they're trying to be like, well, spring training is kind of a deadline. Opening day's a deadline. And yeah. so they're just going to wait for the players to be like, well, all right, I guess I'll come sign because I want to know where I'm going to be with my family for spring training. I want to know where I'm going to be for the year with my family. So I'm going to go take a little bit less because I want to make sure I have a team instead of being jerks and profar of last off season. And I have to go sign with the Rockies after the WBC. And then you, you're, you're not good um, in 2023. And now you're going to be a bench player, maybe on the Padres instead of, you know, getting more money because you were somewhere that was actually a place that you wanted to be. Um, that was a good thing for you. So yeah, the, the, the market it's slow because I think a lot of teams are doing what the Padres are doing, but they have the intent of spending more money than the Padres are, but everyone's just waiting out the market. Yeah. But I mean, like uh, my, my thing is, is that like, what about certain teams? You know, I mean, obviously we can, you know, we can obviously be talking about other our, our Padres or whatever, but I mean, like, you'll take a look at the Cubs, for example. They just lost Marcus Stroman, right? What are they waiting for for this this guy? Yeah. Or even Cody Bellinger? You know, obviously, you know, I hope that some talks are happening, but I also wouldn't be surprised if Cody Bellinger gets signed by the Giants as as a result, you know, of this of this stalemate that's happening. Um, and I mean, I, I think I think yeah, we'll we'll see what happens in terms of just overall signings or whatever. But it's just like I'm kind of like. I'm itching to talk about baseball. I'm itching to get back into it. But like, because there's nothing happening, I'm, I'm so focused on football right now that it's really, who knows what's going to happen, honestly. What, the the Cardinals trading Richie Palacios to the Rays isn't hot enough for you? That's listen, a trade, I guess, that just went down. Listen, I, I you know what? I take back everything I just said. I, excuse me. The, the stove is hot. Everybody watch out. It's it's coming. Yeah, I, I, I mean, in all honesty, like, I hope that there's some big trades that go down. I hope that, you know, next week can be a big free agency week. This month can be a big free agency. It has to be, right? I mean, I don't think that it's going to be, you know, Super Bowl week and all these signings are going to go down. I mean, it might, but like, yeah, it has been. The winter meetings was a dud. It was the biggest headline was, oh, Dave Roberts told everyone about the Shohei Otani meeting. Oh, my goodness. And then, well, the Soto trade happened, but that was kind of at the end. Brian Cashman and Aaron Boone had already left, and that day yeah. was just, just kind of waiting, like, okay, when is it actually going to happen? But yeah, yeah, it's been it's been pretty disappointing, I think, of an off season. Uh, and the Padres, we're going to be waiting more. I feel like it's not. I, I think the Cubs, Giants, teams like that, they're probably going to go because they're going to want the big free agents. And then the leftovers is where the Padres come into. <laughs> this yeah it kind of i mean it, to me it also kind of raises a bigger question in terms of the overall state of the game where like we are beholden there obviously are a lot of parties that are, that are involved within the talks in order to kind of like change the game obviously the players association and stuff like that but i think what this offseason has kind of told us is that 
the progress that other leagues have made, such as the NBA, the NFL, and stuff like that, in regards to like salary cap, in regards to you know trade deadlines and stuff like that, it seems to be working for them. And baseball is seems to be stuck in this archaic, you know, monolithic type rules. And to me, it just seems like something that at the end of this at the end of the day is going to have to give where the owners are going to have to demand for something being like, listen, we got to bring the price down or we got to make these unrealistic prices go down or something fundamentally has to but change within. I don't think I'm maybe it is them, but the players, they're going to get the most money that they can. So I don't fault Frankie Montas for signing with the Reds like that. No. I definitely don't fault them, but you know, some teams operate differently than other teams and, this te- the Padres can't control what the Dodgers are doing this offseason. Other teams couldn't control what the Padres were doing in previous years. And the players have to agree with Major League Baseball and owners for a cap, for things like that. And that's not going to happen. So, yeah, we can, you know, complain about it, but it's this is just the way I feel like it's going to be because there's certain things that need to be agreed upon. And the both sides aren't going to do that. You know, they could barely get a CBA done the last time around. You know, so yeah. there was a there was a lockout. So yeah, in the off season. So it's, I mean, it kind of feels like it's been a lockout this off season a little bit. But yeah, it's just it's not going to change. I don't think. Yeah, well, I mean, I, again, I think like you like you made the point about the CPA, the CBA, or whatever. It's it's there is, I mean, at some point something has to change fundamentally within this, within the off season stuff. Um, and I think that owners specifically are going to make a big old fuckus or a ruckus, excuse me, uh, to, um, excuse me, uh, a ruckus to the Manfred and all the front office people and stuff like that, where something to get eventually have to change. And Manfred is, you know, he's, he's a wielder of, of opinions. He is a lawyer at, at, in his true sense. And so something I think will have to change, uh, if, in order for, some sort of activity to kind of sustain the game, keep people interested, you know, even during the off season and stuff like that. Even, even those casual fans will be super stoked if they get a giant free agent signing coming their way, like Di Sclafani, you know, Ooh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right, John, thank you so much for the time. By man. the way, by the way, by the way, okay. big way to go on the foul territory, buddy. Keep it up. Hey, thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Have a good All one. Right. Yeah. Have a good one. Yeah, I appreciate everyone. I got a lot of messages on social media about that. Hey, I I I think Scott Braun, I think Falter, they're the ones that reached out to me uh, about that opportunity. And if it wasn't for you guys for following me on social media, for being here on YouTube, for having me for allowing this show, I don't say allowing me to grow, allowing the show to grow because you guys are included in this, everyone. Allowing this to grow. Uh, you know, that allows for certain opportunities. So I definitely appreciate them. I appreciate all of you for that. Let's get back into some maybe unrealistic free agent targets. Julio Arias is someone I would put on there. His market value is over 20 mil, and he's just not that great of a human being based on some things that we have read. So that's unrealistic right there. Um, Some other, is Clevenger unrealistic? I, I think because former Padre, what happened there and just look at the market value. You can throw out the former Padre stuff. Market value is almost $14 million, according to Spot Track. The Padres are not in on that. Shamanaya, is that a fit? I don't think I, I would not put that in the unrealistic category. Maybe they come back there. But what I mean, he liked playing for Bob Melvin and he was with the Giants. Wouldn't the Giants just bring him back? Or is there no interest there in Shamanaya? I'm not so sure about that. Brandon Woodruff, I would put that in the unrealistic because the Padres need pitchers that's going to count. To the CBT, they need those pitchers to be healthy and to pitch from the get-go. So I don't think that is a realistic one. So those are some pitchers. If we go to some infielders here that are on the free agent market, let me pull some of those up here. Justin Turner, because he's a righty, that's probably unrealistic, although he is a fit in terms of positions. First base, DH, like that is a fit. He can play third base. If you need him to, if like Hassan Kim gets traded, for example, that is a fit. But would Justin Turner want to come to the Padres? And that is another old veteran guy that, you know, the Padres would be giving their money to. Now, there is no bad one year deals, but what if it's not going to be a one year deal? What if it would have to be a multi year deal? 
I feel like it would just be a one-year deal, but you never know with how this market is, you know, going right now, right? Um, JD Martinez is another one. Michael Brantley retired today, by the way. So that's not even on here. But like JD Martinez, he's gonna get, I think, a good amount of money from a team. He could go back to the D backs. There's there's interest from other teams as well. I saw the Angels there. He's a right-handed hitter. He is like the Tony Gwynn of today, like in terms of pure hitter, lots of batting practice, video. Same thing with Michael Brantley, who that, or, you know, he and J.D. Martinez, Luis Arise, right? Um, so I don't think that's the best fit financially. And he is a right-handed hitter, not a left-handed hitter. What are some other names that are out there that you think aren't fits? Obviously, Matt Chapman, because that's not a, even a free agent target for the Padres because they have Manny Machado. Don't know if anyone knows who Manny Machado is, but obviously, jokingly, obviously, they they have Manny Machado on this team. Uh, Bellinger, like I mentioned. Who are some other? Tim Anderson. I think he's out there still. That's not a fit. Reese Hoskins, he's a righty, but I think we would take Reese Hoskins. But the Padres, I don't think they want to spend $18 million on Reese Hoskins for a one-year pillow contract, a a platform deal for Reese Hoskins. So those are some unrealistic targets that I would have for the Padres. Let me see in the chat. If you have anyone else that I did not mention, feel free to put that in the chat as I go down the chat here. Just a reminder about some of the great partners of the show. SeatGeek Code, Talking Friars, $20 off your order. A a lot of great sporting events um, going on right now, or you can save it for the Padres season. Underdog Fantasy, They will give you a 100% deposit match up to $100. Click that link in the description or use code Talking Friars. There's a lot of great pickums that you can do there. No baseball season, obviously, right now, but there's NBA, there's college basketball, women's college basketball, there's soccer, obviously, NFL, the college football championship game coming up, uh, I believe, next Monday. There's a lot there that you can choose from. Breaking T. Great San Diego sports shirts, sweatshirts, Padres, Aztecs, Wave, Aztecs play this weekend coming up on Saturday afternoon against UNLV. That's going to be another Pac Viejas crowd, national television, and FOCO. They've got some great Padres bobbleheads and collectibles. You can click the link in the description there. Same thing with Breaking Tea. Let's go through the chat here. Before I get to the conversation um, with San Diego Mojo player Ronica Stone, Mark says, I feel, I feel the new CEO is happy with the players we have in the system to take over the open spots. Eric, I, don't, I don't really care what Eric Grutner thinks about the Padres' prospects. I mean, that's more A.J. Preller. That's not Eric Grutner's job. Um, so maybe you mean A.J. Preller. He's confident in that. They know more than me. Like those, Preller obviously knows more than me about the, the prospects. But from having Jim Callis on the show a few weeks back, Seeing other things, it doesn't seem like Jacob Marcy's ready. Graham Pauly probably would be rushing him a little bit. Nathan Martorella, just talked to him on the show this week. You can catch that on YouTube and on podcast platforms. Seems like he works really hard. There's talent there for sure, but I don't know. He might admit that they might be rushing that there. I mean, he's in double A. You might want to get these guys in triple A. I know El Paso, what can you really judge there? But there are former big leaguers that pitch in El Paso. There are guys that are close to the big leagues that pitch in El Paso. Now, there, you could say the same thing about Double A. I don't know. I, I, I just think that some of these prospects that could fill the holes, I'm not so sure they're ready for opening day in Korea, let's say. So that's why I talk about the bridge with the Padres free agents. Or I should say signing free agents, experienced guys for like one year. And then you hope that these prospects can be ready by 2025, by the end of 2024, and come up, not make much money, create more flexibility, and they can actually provide an impact at the big league level after being developed in the Padres farm system. You know, what a concept. Um, Let's see here. Christopher says Snell, very expensive, going to want a ton of money. I agree. Devin says Snell and Belly, kind of the same type of situation. Both are good to have on paper. Eh, kind of, but they are such a heavy risk. Yes, both are going to demand big contracts and both are question marks. Yeah. And why I said eh on paper with those guys is because if you do look on paper, last year, sure, good. 
But if you look on paper, you know, the last three, four years, there are some question marks even on paper with those guys. Definitely with Cody Bellinger. Uh, Devin says, I don't know if the Blue Jays are interested in Belly anymore. Yeah, I mean, they got Kevin Kiermaier. And so, yeah, I'm not so sure. It felt like their big free agent signing was going to be Shohei Otani. And if not him, then that's probably it. Maybe they bring Matt Chapman in, but they signed AKF to a two-year deal. They have some guys that can play the infield there. So I don't even know if they're going to bring back Matt Chapman. It feels like Chapman will just go to a team like the Giants, who I, that would be a fit. So we'll see. But yeah, I think the Blue Jays are probably done on big moves. It's not like they've made, maybe they make a trade, but they haven't made big moves. They were in on Otani and seemed like the whole time he wanted to go to the Dodgers. All right, let's see. Joseph says, so glad Hater is gone. What a punk that dude is. I'm not going to go that far. I just disagreed with some of the things he said, and I wanted him to be more available last season. You know, when things are going down, the, they're circling down the drain. When it's the middle of the year, even when things aren't circling the drain, but it doesn't look pretty, I wanted him to be more available. And I believe fully that the Padres wanted him to be more available. I don't buy that, oh, it was a two -way, it's a two-way conversation. Conversation. The Padres could have let Hader know. Like That's what Hader, I think, was saying to someone on Instagram in a comment. If I remember correctly, earlier, or I guess I should say last year, because we're in 2024 now, I think that's what happened there. I mean, dude, what? So the, you're saying that the Padres didn't ask if you wanted to go four outs, if you could go four outs, if you could pitch in the eighth inning, not the ninth? They didn't ask you that? Like, I just don't agree with that. I think the Padres did. And Hader probably made it clear that, yeah, no, not doing it. Don't want to do that. I have free agency coming up. Are we in the playoff race? Like, that just validates that the Padres tried and Hader was the problem there. Mark asks, if Go becomes our closer, do we trade Suarez? I don't know, if who's, I don't know who's going to take that contract. Because that is a significant reliever contract. Maybe a team would. But no, you you paid Suarez to be at the back end of your bullpen. One bad year, you know, I don't even want to say like bad year, but it was a disappointing year, sure, because he was hurt for, you know, the first half of the year. One year like that, that should not say, okay, trade Robert Suarez. It just because Go becomes the closer, right? That doesn't mean that Go is going to be the closer the entire year. Matsui could be it. Suarez could be it. Suarez could be the closer, and then Go becomes the closer, you know? So they could rotate it. Mike Schill was talking to the media, and he, I think he said, essentially, we don't have a firm plan on, like, yeah, this guy's the closer right now. That was before the Wusuk Go signing officially came down. Joseph says, could we afford Bellinger on a deal with an AAV of, like, 16 mil a season? I would say no on that, and he's not going to get that. Joseph says, if so, that leaves us like nine mil to get a first baseman like Cooper or Santana, and then we just roll with what we got after that. So you would stick who in left field then if Bellinger's in center? Let's say it is 16 mil a season. Okay. Then you get Carlos Santana, and then you have three starters in the rotation, and then it's question marks the rest of the way there. And who's playing left? You know, like, AJ's got to be creative here. Bellinger, it's not happening. 16 mil a season, like, that's not happening, I don't think. Let's say it's 200 over seven years. I mean, that's 28 million a year. Maybe that's unrealistic. Maybe it. Maybe we should spread the, the years out to lower the AAV, but it's going to be more than 16. Isn't that what Bellinger made this past year? He may have, I think he made more than that this past year with the Cubs. So... Talk about unrealistic free agents. I think that's an unrealistic AAV. With all due respect, that, that's just not realistic. Chris, Yes, I agree, Christopher. I would like to see Profar get brought back again, but not as a starter. Maybe he's a starter at some point, but I mean, I like him because he can play multiple positions and it wouldn't cost a lot of money coming off the year that he just had. And it seems like when he plays with the Padres, he's better than when he plays with another team. But 
I think you got to aim higher. Someone like David Peralta, maybe, as left field. Max Kepler in a trade. Someone like that. Then say, yeah, Profar, let's let's give him the starting left field spot. You know, 2022 was a great year. But is he going to do that again two years later? Uh, I'm not so sure about that. Eddie, thank you so much for this comment. Says, good job on foul territory, Ben. Only reason I watched that show yesterday. Well, they had Joel Sherman on. He came. He was on before me. And then as I was ending my conversation with them, I saw Gary Sheffield in that chat, in the, the whatever you call it, the interview room, waiting to come on the show. So that was pretty cool to see that. And I, I ended the interview like, yeah, Gary's more important than me. And Adam Jones goes, yeah, a little bit little bit so i mean they had gary sheffield on you should have you should have watched that it was a good interview too i mean i hope gary sheffield can get into the hall of fame because it seems like everything that he was saying was correct and bob nightingale did his research and it seems like he is getting unfairly punished for something that he wasn't involved in like with i don't want to just go down this whole different rabbit hole about steroids but I mean, we're on this topic about because he was on foul territory yesterday and he's a former Padre and he was involved because he worked out with Barry Bonds and he put, uh, I think, a balm on to stop bleeding during a workout with his knee and he didn't know that it contained a steroid, I guess, in it. And he never took steroids, though, like knowingly he never took it while he was playing, like during a season. Um, he was only a part of. Uh, the the Balco stuff because he was testifying about Barry Bonds. Like, it was about Barry. They weren't asking him about, did you take steroids or anything? It was about, what do you know about Barry Bonds? And then he got grouped in with that. And so, I mean, yeah, it, it's... Hopefully he gets in. I don't, I don't know if he's going to get in. I don't feel great about his chances of getting in this year. It's his last year, I think, on the ballot. But he, he can get in on that other ballot that they have. And he'll be put on that and... It would be a shame if he's not put in, at least on that ballot. Joey Gallo is another one. I don't think that's unrealistic, but that is someone I see here in the chat. Yeah, well, I said this the other day. One of these years, right, Gallo's going to end up a Padre. I would be surprised if he doesn't end up a Padre. Um, Guffield to Fish says Bellinger isn't getting 200 mil. He might want it, but he isn't getting it. I don't know. There might be that one team that's like, we need to guarantee that we get a star here. Let's get Bellinger. I mean, it only took one team with Bogarts last year with the Padres, right? 280. I'm not saying Bellinger's going to get 280. Definitely not saying that. But all it takes is one team to do it. And Scott Boris is the best in the game for a reason. So I, I'm not. Maybe I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be surprised if he got. A little less than 200, but I, I it's probably going to be around 200, I would think. I don't think it's going to be like 100 or 130 or even 150. I think he's going to get more than that. All it takes is one. And the Giants, they don't have a star. Jung-Hoo Lee, I'm sorry. That, that's not the face of the franchise star. He could be at some point. Like, Kim's a big fan favorite here. He's still not the face of the franchise, but he's loved here. That could be Jung-Hoo Lee in a little bit, but... Not right out of the gate. Bellinger, are there better faces of the franchise? Yeah. I mean, I'd rather have Manny as my face. I'd rather have Tatis, Judge, Otani, Trout, Harper. But, you know, Bellinger, there's still talent there. You know, it's 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 a recognizable name for sure. All right. I want to get to the interview with Ronica Stone, San Diego Mojo star, their inaugural season. Coming up here in 2024. So without further ado, let's get to it. This was earlier today, talking with Ronica about her excitement to play for San Diego Mojo. They're going to be at Vieas Arena, um, her experience with the Oregon Ducks, and talking about some other San Diego stuff. Hey everybody, Ben Fadden here, Talking Friars, and I'm with a special guest. I've been waiting for this uh, for uh, this whole week. Ronica Stone, who is going to be a star player on the San Diego Mojo, the new women's volleyball team coming to the town. They're already going to be in town here this week, later this week. Uh, Vieira Arena is going to be their 
home arena. And I can't wait to see this team in action. Ronica, thank you so much for joining. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. All right. So before we get started, fans, by the way, you can get your tickets, San Diego Mojo VB.com. All the information is going to be in the description. It's in the little ticker down here on the YouTube side of things. Uh, first question. So I know training camp starts, I think, on Sunday. Players are going to be coming in. But you've been on this team or known that you're going to be on this team now for a while. What was your reaction when you were first named to this team? You knew you were going to be joining. And did it give you more confidence that this was going to be the right move for you, knowing that Kerry Walsh Jennings was going to be the owner of it? Um, and then your coach as well, Taiba Hinev Park, was going to be a part of it. Yeah, those are all bonuses to what I already thought was an amazing franchise to be a part of. And then just hearing the names continue, Taiba and then Dietra as well, just surrounded by greatness. I'm a Californian, so being able to play in my home state and have my family and friends be able to support is huge and something I never thought would be able to happen. But yeah, when I was first joining the league, I was working just with player relations, trying to figure out which girls, recruiting girls, seeing who was interested in the league. And then once names for teams started coming out and I heard California, I was like, oh, I want to go to California. And I'm glad that it worked out and I'm glad I'm here. Yeah, California is definitely the best. Um, you grew up, obviously, in an athletic family. Your father, former pro bowler. Your brother played Washington State. Another sister with you at Oregon. Um, did you always know that you wanted to play volleyball professionally? Um, yeah, not always. At first, I was playing basketball. And I thought basketball was, was going to do it for me. And then I played volleyball. I loved it. I loved the team. Basketball is a team sport too, but I love the energy um, coming together after each point. That makes me really happy and how you can express yourself on the court. And so once I started playing, I was like, okay, I want to go to college for this. I didn't know about pro yet. And by the time I got to like my senior year of high school, I was like, I want to continue and playing. And at the time it was only you graduate, you go overseas. So I went to France. And now with Pro Volleyball Federation being announced, I jumped at the opportunity to play in the States. Yeah, like the perfect scenario. Because people yeah. don't, I don't know if everyone knows that. Like, yeah, there was no big league before that here in America. So people had to go overseas to play. Um, and that's mm -hmm. sometimes not the best uh, environment for, for players in terms of just being comfortable where they're at. Um, yeah, exactly. What are, what other sports are you into? Obviously, with your family, with Jordan Love, who yeah. <laughs> not a big fan of right now. I, my family is a Minnesota Vikings. They're Minnesota Vikings fans. Uh, I have no. family in Minnesota. And <laughs> when the Chargers left, they leave. They go to LA. There was no way I was going to be rooting for the Chargers anymore. So I hopped on with the Vikings. And yeah, this past week that was not fun to watch. It was so exciting for me <laughs> to yeah, watch. And now they're in a win and in situation, which is double exciting. I can't wait to watch. I'm sad that I can't be there in person, but I'll be cheering him on. But yeah, no, athletics has been huge. My sport growing up, we I was always watching basketball. Um, I was playing it. I was watching it. Loved we had season tickets to Warriors games. And so I was always there. And then I started, I mean, my dad, yeah, he played in the NFL for 13 years, but I didn't really start watching or learning about football until I was at Oregon. And probably my sophomore, junior year is when I started getting into it more. And I was like, okay, this is a cool sport. And then dating Jordan. Now I'm like fully in. I'm like, P.I., hey, P.I., like, throw the yeah. flag. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I just see online like Packers fans love you and your reactions awesome. to the team and all that. Uh, but yeah, that was not a great experience for me, but I know that was an amazing, great game for you um, yeah. being on the other side of things. Um, why? Let's let's go to Oregon. I'm a big Oregon fan. I didn't go to Oregon. I'm mm -hmm. actually wearing Sabrina ones right now. Oh, um, nice. Why? Why Oregon? And what did you learn there um, that has helped you in your career so far? I wanted to play at a competitive school and the Pac-12 RIP, oh my gosh, it makes me sad, was 
is one of the best conferences for volleyball. And so when I was going through my recruiting process and talking to these schools, when I went to Oregon and I met the girls, and I think it's really important for girls who are getting recruited, talk to the girls that you will be playing with. I think sometimes girls will talk to the juniors and seniors, but they're gonna be gone by the time you get there. So I, I really enjoyed meeting the girls that I would be playing with. And I had a really great relationship with now the head coach who was the assistant coach at the time. But I wanted to be at a school that wasn't just a football school or it's a basketball school. I wanted a school that was competitive in all the sports. I, and Oregon is that. It's the epitome of competitiveness. I think it's football, women's basketball, men's basketball. When I got there, I think our golf team had won a national championship and then track, of course. But yeah, I loved that it was such a small but like tight knit community. Our athletics department was super close. Everyone supported everyone. We all went to each other's games and um, learning. I think the biggest thing I learned were just relationships and building and keeping them. The connections that I've made at Oregon have helped me through college and past college. They, I was able to job shout on Maria Taylor when I was at ESPN. I told them I was interested in journalism. They gave got me a YouTube bowling show, 10 frames with Veronica, and I was yeah. able to interview other athletes um, during my time there. And so they are just so supportive of their athletes and they want to see you grow. And so I think just making those connections, keeping those connections and just furthers you in the future. Yeah. If anyone goes and checks out that video, she actually <laughs> interviewed Sabrina and the competitive yeah. spirit definitely came out in both of them. You won, right? Yeah. I, I think I only won. lost once. Yeah. And they cheated so it was fine <laughs> See, there you go yeah um have you learned anything from jordan or other members of your family that has also helped you in your career now or are you are you kind of making it clear to jordan and everyone like you're the teacher it's not it's not the other way around i think we learn a lot from each other uh we're very similar and how we are i think leadership wise maybe i i might be a little more outgoing uh and talkative but we have similar mindsets and i've learned a lot from him just seeing his process like right when he gets home he is watching film he is and i always joke around with him I'm like you just spent hours at the facility playing ball with the boys and now you're coming back home and you're watching yourself play ball with the boys but like <laughs> it's all a joke and he works so hard and watching what he does day in and day out and it motivates me to want to work harder. I think it's really hard in the off season. That's the hardest part about being an athlete is when you have to do that work on your own. You don't have the team around you. And so being in Green Bay during the off season and seeing what he's doing every day, like makes me not want to be like, okay, well, I'm on the couch. Let me continue watching TV. Like, let me get up and get active. And so we, we talk a bunch about what makes us better, what we think like during the team, I think he, yeah, he just has a really steady mind and we help each other a lot. That's awesome. So I work for San Diego Wave FC. They're the women's soccer team in town. I'm mm -hmm. curious, have you, I mean, because their team has broke records. They have been very, very successful in their first two seasons here. Have you been able to, or any of your teammates have been able to talk with any of these players to yeah. ask questions and learn about how you can grow your sport in your first season, getting this off the ground here? We haven't spoken enough about that. They came not all of them, but a handful came to our brand reveal. And we just talked about how amazing it is to have more women's sports in San Diego. And they were just talking about growing, I mean, their fandom and their fan base and how that was for them, but not enough. And I'm excited to go to one of their games and continue to learn about soccer because that's something I don't really know that much about. That's not one of the sports that I have watched, but they have a lot of great athletes there. They have Olympians on their team as well. So it's I think there's a lot of greatness in this city and I'm excited to see it continue to grow, but yeah, we definitely have to have more conversations with them. Who is your, from the brief time, like who is your favorite personality that you were able to meet there? I think Kaylin Sheridan was probably yeah, there. Kaylin. Yeah. Kaylin. Uh, I've talked to her the most and her wife now is a huge Packers fan. So we were able to <laughs> talk a little more, but um, Kaylin for sure. She's really the only one I've, talk to one-on-one. -on -one. We spoke in a group setting. There was another, um, I forget her name, but she's from Northern California. It was just funny because I saw her and I was like, you look super familiar. Naomi Germer? I think so. Yeah. Okay. She was like, oh, I went to Pioneer. And I was like, oh my gosh, I went, our high schools were close. And I recognized her just from like Cal High Sports. We had our own little 
media thing in high school. And so she was on the Cal High Sports TV and I had seen her. It's just like small world. The sports world is so small. But yeah, they've got a lot of great personalities, a lot of great athletes, obviously. Um, have you set goals for 2024? Obviously, the Olympics. Um, what what goals do you have and what goals do you have for this team here? Uh, I'm excited to see. I like to take things like kind of game by game. I don't want to rush into anything. Of course, the goal is championship. I think that's always uh, what everyone wants. And But I'm excited about 2024. It's the year of the Tiger, 1998. So technically, it's, it's my year. And I think there's going to be a lot of great things, but I think just helping this league grow, uh, not only our team, but the league, I think we can really get something started here and get a lot of people behind us to rally behind us. I think viewership across the United States, not only just in person at home games, but watching us and streaming our games, they signed a deal with NBC sports and hopefully there's more traction with that and they get more TV deals, but I think my biggest goal is just to grow, grow the sport and grow as a player, grow as a leader, grow as a person. And I think once, you know, work on your inner self, then the rest, I don't know, will unfold. And I, I'm just waiting to see, waiting and seeing what's going to come. If I worry about my growth and the growth of the team, I think so many great things can happen. How excited are you to be able to call Viejas Arena home here in 2024? Very I've never been. I've never okay. been. Uh, but even with, because I, again, I watch basketball, their men's basketball team. I forgot like how great they, they, they are. They're, yep. Yeah, the final four. And I mean, they're selling out their arena. And I hope those same fans can come and help us sell out. But no, I, I think there's a lot of history here. and. I'm just excited to learn more about it because this is all still new to me. Even though I'm a Californian, I feel like San Diego is, it's different. Everyone speaks about it. Like they put it on a pedestal. It's the most mm -hmm. beautiful city. It's not like that. It's slower than LA, but it's like beautiful and there's still a lot going on. So I'm excited to learn more. So when you were growing up or you probably have the same favorite sports teams now other than NFL mm -hmm. with the Packers, but what are your favorite <laughs> yeah. sports teams? Uh, I loved, my dad is from Boston. And so when I was growing up, he always had Celtics games on. But then once we were in California and I got to learn for myself, I still respect the Celtics, but love the Warriors. Um, and then for football, yes, by default, I am a Packers fan. I didn't really have an NFL team. It was always whatever team my dad was playing for. And then whatever teams he was playing for, if they were on TV, I'd be like, go Niners, go Cowboys. But now it's, yeah, it's definitely go Pat Go. Um, and then, yeah, I need to get more into soccer. Have not watched baseball. That's that's another sport I need to learn more about. And I know San Diego's big in baseball. Padres so. are big. Yep. Yeah. So I I need to go. I need to get to a baseball game. And then I love watching like the Grand Slams in tennis. Okay. Um, Coco Golf is amazing, but yes. just I love watching all the Grand Slams. It's they're in another life. I think I'm a tennis player. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you can obviously see the similarities between yeah. the two. Yeah. Um, okay. Some, some quick questions here to end. So you've been in San Diego, you were in San Diego a little bit, I know with you mm -hmm. and the team, what were your favorite food spots? If you were able to go to any. Ooh, when I came, we came here during uh, the bye week, Jordan's bye week. And I met with the GM and head coach. They took us, I think it was called Costera. It was like a Mex like a really fancy Mexican restaurant, but it was bomb. And but I haven't had enough to be like, oh, and I love this place. California, in and out. I'll just yes, say that's there we go. That's, that's what I was gonna ask. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the lines are super long and you it's just gotta it. go in, no drive through. Sometimes you do the drive through, but yeah. yeah. The, it's it's really good. There's there's some in and out haters, which I don't really understand. Crazy. Yeah, we gotta hook you up with Padres Wave. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. because the Wave has been great atmospheres, environment, and then Petco Park attendance record. So hopefully people will show up for San Diego Mojo, obviously. Um, just what who would be your favorite teammate so far? Like who are the, the Ooh, stars <laughs> alongside yourself? I know you're gonna upset someone here. 
Oh my gosh, I can't name a favorite teammate. I played with four of them already, so yeah. I can't name a favorite. I'm excited um, to play with them all again. I think I'm most excited about playing with Nutsara Tomcom. I got to, I think I was only on her team once during Athletes Unlimited, maybe once or twice, but she's such a dynamic setter. She's a magician on the court. And so, especially my position, I'm a middle and Everyone always says like middles only get set on perfect balls. She's someone that will run you no matter what. Like she's bump setting. She, she's going to be really excited to watch. And I can't wait to be set by her. She's a legend. So yeah, that's awesome. Don't All tell right. anybody else. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely not going to send this out. Um, okay. Veronica Stone, San Diego Mojo. Great. She's going to be a star for this team. Amazing conversation. Really fun. A again, everyone. The Os Arena is going to be where their home arena is at. February 23rd is their home opener. Um, their first yeah. game of the year, I believe, is going to be on the road. First couple games of the year. Yeah. Um, but it's going to be super fun. CBS Sports, I believe, is the television partner. Tickets, San Diego Mojo, VB.com. There's a season ticket deposits that you can place there. Again, all the information is going to be in the description. Um, Veronica, thank you so much for yes. the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All right, so there was our conversation there with Ronica Stone. Hopefully, everybody enjoyed that. And again, go support them. It's great having women's sports um, and the growth of women's sports, especially here in San Diego. Um, I just wanted to close out here with some people in the chat. If there's any more in the chat, Christopher says, Happy Friday, Padres fans. Indeed, Happy Friday. Lil Casino says Snell would be cool, but there would be a log jam when the younger guys are ready. That's true. If Snell was like consistent year in, year out, then you could use those younger guys to trade, but Snell hasn't been super consistent with the Padres, right? Yes, Austin Nola headed to the Brewers. That was something that happened earlier today. I was not sure if there was going to be a team that was going to pick up Austin Nola, but they did. And I'm looking here, Adam McAlvey, who covers the Milwaukee Brewers. This was earlier today. Brewers have signed Austin Nola to a minor league deal with an invitation to big league camp. 34-year-old became a free agent when the Padres non-tendered him in November. If he wasn't going to sign with another team, I think the Padres were going to give him a minor league deal. But they probably had conversations with Austin and said, hey, you're not a priority for us, obviously, this offseason. If you can go find someone that you think they are a priority, like you are a priority to them, go do that. Like we want what is best for you. Um, you're just not a part of it right now with us, you know, with Higashioka, Sullivan. I think he's younger than Nola. Um, and then obviously with Luis Camposano, we weren't going to give you that contract. If you can go somewhere else, go somewhere else. It's not going to be personal against us. We non-tendered you. So hopefully that's what the conversation was like and the Padres wanted what was best for Austin. And I'm wishing nothing but the best for Austin as long as he's not playing the Padres. Um, it sucks what happened there. You know, getting hit in spring training. I know he wasn't great with the bat, but it seemed like he was a great teammate. You know, treated the media with respect, at least with the videos and audio that I heard and saw from members of the credentialed media there in the Padres clubhouse. So, you know, he came up with some big hits as well in the postseason. If you remember wild card NLCS, obviously, I know they didn't win the NLCS, but he came up with that hit. He, I believe he hit that little number to first to start that rally in uh, the NLDS when Crony obviously came up with that hit there in that inning there to give the Padres the five, three lead. I want to say in that spot. So it's not like everything was bad. Yes, the Padres did not win that trade with Seattle. Uh, but going forward, wishing nothing but the best, obviously, for Austin Nola um, with the Milwaukee Brewers. Zigzag760 says, Eddie Rosario in left field. I'd be open to it. I've said that before. It's a lefty bat. It wouldn't cost too much. Probably like David Peralta range, maybe. I don't know if he'd be a multi-year deal. Maybe he'd be a one-year deal. But yeah, I'd be open to it. The yeah, Padres need lefties, right? If it's a if it's a good righty, you know, you can make the exception. But if it's a lefty or righty and it's pretty comparable, you're probably going to pick the lefty if you're the Padres. 
Yeah, Mojo is a great team name. Yeah, Kerry Walsh Jennings came up with that name. Lil Casino says Rosario versus Gallo. So Gallo can play better defense. Rosario can hit for average, higher average. Maybe both and expand our bench and DH options. Who's playing center, though? So you would sign, or you would have Tatis play center, and you'd have those guys play the corners? Gallo's more of just like a DH bat, though. And I think the Padres should have that for Manny to start the year if he's going to be dh to start the year and use that more in a flexible role where guys can take half days off there instead of having a permanent DH. Because then if guys can play, but they can't play the field, but they can hit, let's say, then you have the DH there. That DH is not getting an at-bat then, or that player, one of your stars, isn't going to be able to hit because your DH is taking up that spot. And then you're going to send Matthew Batten or someone else, no disrespect to him, but I'm just naming a guy that could come off the bench. You're putting that guy in the lineup, and then your star can't hit because you have a DH full-time there. You know, J.D. Martinez, okay, but I don't think that fits for the Padres financially. And he's a righty, not a lefty. So I'd rather just leave that DH spot open and have it be flexible. Um, Lil Casino says, women's volleyball is fun. I want to see you guys play sometime. Yeah, San Diego Mojo. Yep, their season starts in February. Home opener is in late February. Again, you can go to their website. The link is in the description here for the YouTube audience, podcast audience, wherever. Uh, you'll be able to find that link. You can follow them on social media as well. All right. That's going to do it. Talking for hours, episode 549. Thank you all for the time. Hopefully you enjoyed this show. Have a great rest of your night and I'll talk to y'all later. See ya.